The first section in the musculoskeletal pathology chapter deals with the skeletal system. The first disorder is achondroplasia. A means without. Chondro refers to the chondrocytes that make cartilage, and plasia refers to growth. So this is a disorder of cartilage proliferation in the growth plate. It's due to an activating mutation in fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. Very high yield board examiners like to go after this. You need to know that it is an activating mutation and you need to know that the mutation is in fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. Now what happens here is that you get this receptor turned on because of the mutation and when you turn the receptor on that inhibits the growth of the cartilage. This is autosomal dominant. Uh, the mutations are related to increased paternal age uh, and most mutations are sporadic. The result of achondroplasia will be that the patients will have short extremities with normal sized head and chest. This is very high yield and it goes back to embryology. Let's remind ourselves that there are two ways by which bone can be formed. The first is called intramembranous, and in intramembranous you simply produce bone from a connective tissue matrix. So you've got connective tissue and the connective tissue becomes bone, and that's the way by which the bones of the skull are made, and the bones of the chest are made, and the flat bones, for example, of the wrist are made. Again, this is referred to as intramembranous bone formation. Now in this particular disorder, there is no problem with intramembranous bone formation, and so they have a normal sized head and a normal sized chest. The second way by which bone is formed is called endochondral bone formation, and this is where you establish a cartilage matrix, the cartilage dies, it gets calcified and mineralized, and then becomes bone. Again, that's called endochondral bone formation, and that's the key mechanism by which our long bones grow. You're well aware of the histology of the growth plate. Of course, it's made of cartilage, and as the growth plate expands, the chondrocytes begin to die at one edge of that plate, and then they're replaced with bone, and that's how the long bones get longer. And so these patients are going to present with short extremities because they have a defect in their proliferation of chondrocytes at the cartilage growth plate. Now important to note that mental function will be fine, lifespan will be fine, and fertility will also not be affected. The next disorder is osteogenesis imperfecta. This is imperfect formation of bone. It's a congenital defect of bone formation and it results in weak bone. The, it's most commonly due to an autosomal dominant defect in type 1 collagen. Remember that type 1 collagen is the collagen that is present in bone and some people remember that by just remembering that the word bone has the letter 1 in it. The clinical features are going to be multiple fractures. Without type 1 collagen, the bone will be very weak and it'll fracture. Uh, in addition, the patients will have blue sclera. The idea here is that the sclera, which is the white of the eye, is, normally contains a lot of type 1 collagen. And so if there's a defect in type 1 collagen, the sclera will be thin and you'll see blue sclera. Now board examiners like to ask you why the sclera are blue, and the answer is, is that it's due to exposure of the choroidal veins, high yield. Exposure of the choroidal veins. In addition, the patients can develop hearing loss, and that's because you have little tiny bones in the middle ear that help to transmit the sound that comes from the outside world, and those bones can then fracture because they also need type 1 collagen. And so again, hearing loss is an important feature as well. Osteopetrosis is a disorder in which you have abnormally thick, heavy bone. Petrosis means rock-like. And this arises with an inherited defect of bone resorption. Now let's go back and remind ourselves that bone formation is a balance between the osteoblasts, which lay down bone, and the osteoclasts, which resorb bone. And this balance is constantly occurring throughout life, so that you're always laying down some bone and you're always resorbing bone. Now imagine if you had a defect in bone resorption, so that you laid down bone, laid down bone, laid down bone, but you couldn't resorb it. If you can't resorb it, that's going to result in abnormally thick, heavy bone. Now the interesting thing is that despite this abnormally thick heavy bone, it actually fractures easily. It's, it's sort of like a piece of chalk. It's thick, but you can easily crack it. This disorder is due to poor osteoclast function. Of course, the osteoclast are the cells that resorb bone, and there are multiple genetic variants. Of those, the carbonic anhydrase 2 mutation is particularly high yield. Examiners like to go after this because it ties into physiology. In order to understand this, you need to know that an acidic environment is necessary in order to remove calcium to resorb bone. The way I remember this is that I happen to live in Chicago and there is calcium in the water and so calcium can build up in the pipes as they're used over time. And so one of the recommendations is to take a can of Coca-Cola or some kind of acid and pour it down the pipes every six months. And the idea is that when you put that acid down the pipes, the acid will leach the calcium from the pipes, helping to remove calcium from the pipes. So again, 
an acidic environment is necessary in order to remove calcium from the bone during the resorption process. Now in order to generate that acidic environment, one of the enzymes that's particularly useful is carbonic anhydrase. Recall that carbonic anhydrase can take water plus CO2 and combine it to produce H2CO3. And of course carbonic anhydrase catalyzes that reaction. The H2CO3 then becomes acid plus bicarb and this acid will then go out of the cell to create the acidic environment and the acidic environment will then result in the resorption of bone. Now imagine if the osteoclasts don't have the ability to generate this acidic environment then they won't be able to resorb bone. And that's exactly what occurs in the carbonic anhydrase 2 mutation. And this becomes again very high yield for the purposes of board exam. Here's an x-ray of osteopetrosis and what should catch your attention is that the bone is super thick. Now remember normally you should see a dark space here where the medulla would be present. But instead you just see a completely thickened bone. And again this image is also particularly high yield. The clinical features of osteopetrosis will be bone fracture. Remember that the bone, although it's thick, is going to be weak, and that's because there is no proper balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast. In order to make good, strong bone, you need a balance between both the osteoclast and the osteoblast. The patients can also have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. Now the idea here is that if this is bone, you're getting a thickening of the bone, which is beginning to replace the medullary space. And when you replace the medullary space, that's called a myelothysic process. Now this myelothysic process is then going to knock out the ability for hematopoiesis to occur. And so the patients will get anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia with extra medullary hematopoiesis in the spleen and the liver. The patients can also develop vision and hearing impairment. And the idea here is that you're going to get compression of cranial nerves as they try to exit from the skull, again, because of the thickening of the bone. There can also be hydrocephalus, and that's because you can get thickening of the bone at the foramen magnum. A final feature is that the patients can develop renal tubular acidosis. This is when the patients develop a metabolic acidosis within the blood due to a defect in the tubule. So we call that renal tubular acidosis. And this is seen with carbonic anhydrase deficiency and is particularly high yield because it ties back into physiology. Recall that if this is the tubular cell and this is the lumen, that the tubular cell has the ability to take H2O and CO2 and combine it to H2CO3 and of course it does that using carbonic anhydrase. Now the H2CO3 will then break down into hydrogen ion and HCO3 or bicarb and the hydrogen ion will be transferred to the lumen. It will join with NH3 to form NH4+. And NH4 plus is important because this will then be excreted, and so it's a way of getting rid of acid. And when you get rid of this acid, this will result in a net gain of bicarb going into the blood, maintaining the pH of the blood. Now imagine, if you don't have carbonic anhydrase, you won't be able to generate this acid, and therefore you won't be able to excrete this acid, and therefore you won't be able to get this net gain of bicarb. And if you don't get the net gain of bicarb, the patients then will get acidotic. And so you'll get renal tubular acidosis. And this, again, this physiology is particularly high yield. The treatment is bone marrow transplant, and this is also particularly high yield. You might think, well, why would a bone marrow transplant help in osteopetrosis? Well, the answer is that remember that in osteopetrosis, the problem is that the osteoclasts are not functioning properly. And remember that the osteoclasts are basically macrophages that are present within the bone. Now, of course, the osteoclasts or the macrophages are derived from monocytes, and the monocytes come from hematopoiesis. And therefore, if you give a bone marrow transplant, you're going to give back the ability to make normal monocytes, and therefore you'll make normal osteoclasts. And again, this is a particularly high yield association given all of that uh, interplay. The next two disorders are rickets and osteomalacia. And in both of these disorders, you have defective mineralization of osteoid. Now let's go back and remind ourselves that the osteoblasts, they lay down bone. However, they don't produce bone. They actually produce a material called osteoid. That osteoid then gets mineralized by calcium and phosphate to produce the final bone. And so in, in rickets and osteomalacia, this mineralization process is defective. This is going to be due to low levels of vitamin D. And recall that vitamin D acts on the intestine, the kidney, and the bone in order to resorb both calcium and phosphate. And so that's the primary role of vitamin D, and that is to maintain both the calcium and the phosphate within the blood. 
Now, some of the ways in which a vitamin D deficiency could develop include decreased sun exposure. Recall from biochemistry that most of the vitamin D in your blood is actually derived from exposure of the skin to the sun. Uh, it can also arise from poor diet. Um, there is a percentage of vitamin D that comes from your diet. It can arise from malabsorption. Of course, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. And then it can also arise from liver failure and renal failure, and that's because both the kidney and the liver are essential for activating vitamin D. When vitamin D deficiency arises in children, we call that rickets, and it usually arises in kids less than one year of age. The classic clinical findings are a pigeon breast deformity. This is where you get an inward bending of the ribs with an anterior protrusion of the sternum. The patients can also get, develop frontal bossing. Uh, this is when the forehead is particularly prominent, uh, and that arises due to osteoid deposition on the skull. Another feature is rachitic rosary. Uh, this is due to deposition of osteoid at the costral chondral junction. And so you can actually feel the costal chondral junctions in the patient's rib, and they feel like little beads. And so they call that a rachitic rosary, the rosary being the beads that people worship on, and rachitic because you're dealing with rickets. And finally, if the child is greater than the age of one and is actually ambulating and walking around, there can be bowing of the legs, and that's because you get weakening of the long bones as they grow from the growth plate. Now, the central theme with all these is that you're going to have abnormal mineralization of osteoid, and often you'll see deposition of osteoid in various places. For example, the rachitic rosary is due to deposition of osteoid at the costochondral junction. And I repeat this because board examiners like you to know that there's deposition of osteoid. If there's a deficiency in vitamin D in adults, we call that osteomalacia. Now, this results in weak bone with an increased risk for fracture. Now the idea here is that your bone is always being turned over. The osteoclasts are always removing bone, and the osteoblasts are always laying down new bone. And so imagine that if the osteoclasts are removing bone, but the osteoblasts are laying down bone, but it can't be mineralized, then you're going to end up getting weak bone, which can fracture. You'll have an increased risk of fracture in the weight-bearing areas, for example, in the vertebral bodies uh, or in the hip. One of the key features of osteomalacia is that the laboratories will be abnormal. The calcium and the phosphate will be down because there's a vitamin D deficiency. And the PTH will be up because there's low calcium. And finally, the alkaline phosphatase will be elevated. I want to make sure that you understand that whenever there is activation of the osteoblast, there's going to be a high alkaline phosphatase. And the idea here is that alkaline phosphatase creates an alkaline environment, and the alkaline environment is necessary to lay down calcium into the osteoid. Remember when we talked about osteopetrosis, I told you that an acidic environment is necessary to remove calcium. Well, the opposite is also true. An alkaline environment is necessary to add calcium. And so osteoblasts have alkaline phosphatase because they create an alkaline environment that will then allow them to calcify the unmineralized osteoid. Osteoporosis is when you have a loss of trabecular bone mass, and this results in porous bone, hence the term osteoporosis, that has an increased risk for fracture. The risk of osteoporosis is based on the peak bone mass and the rate of bone loss thereafter. In order to understand this, you need to understand a basic principle. Let's assume that this is bone mass on this axis here, and this is age on this axis. Then over time, an individual develops something called the peak bone mass. This peak bone mass occurs at roughly the age of 30. Now, there are three things that determine how high this peak will be. Number one, your diet. Number two, exercise. And number three, the vitamin D receptor that you inherit from your parents. So your genetics, basically. But in particular, the vitamin D receptor that you inherit from your parents. Now, these three factors play an important role in determining this height or this peak bone mass. Now, once you peak at 30, it's all downhill, and you begin to lose bone mass slowly over time. There's no avoiding it, and it's approximately less than 1% per year. However, it occurs in everyone. Now, what determines the rate of this bone loss is also going to be diet and exercise. And so if there's a good diet and exercise, you'll lose less than 1%. If the diet and exercise are poor, you might lose bone at a more rapid rate. Um, and also, what's important is that estrogen is protective. And so that when patients have estrogen on board, they don't lose that much bone mass. However, once estrogen is lost, for example, in a postmenopausal woman, then you end up losing bone mass much more rapidly. Now, let's remind ourselves that when you cross this border, for example, and you come underneath this border in bone mass, the bone becomes weak and it fractures, and that's called osteoporosis.
Now with that background in mind, let's go back and read the text. Now the most common forms are senile. Of course, if this is your peak bone mass, then the longer you live, the more likely you are to cross that line. And also postmenopausal. And again, that is because once you get peak bone mass, estrogen helps to prevent the loss of bone. However, once estrogen is lost after menopause, bone is lost more rapidly. And so you'll more quickly cross that line. So two most common forms, senile and postmenopausal. Now the clinical features are that you get bone pain and fractures in weight-bearing areas. And the weight-bearing areas include the vertebra, uh, giving you loss of height and kyphosis, the hip, giving you an increased risk of fracture, and the distal radius, also giving you an increased risk of fracture. If you want to monitor the patient's bone density, you can use something called a DEXA scan. And the idea here is that the DEXA scan allows you to determine where you are on this chart to determine how much bone mass you actually have. And very high yield to note that in this particular disorder, the calcium, phosphate, PTH, and alkaline phosphatase are all normal. There will be no abnormal labs in this disorder. And that's very high yield because having normal labs helps to distinguish this disease from osteomalacia, which can present in a very similar way, but would be due to a vitamin D deficiency. Now the treatment is exercise, vitamin D, and calcium. And the goal here is to limit bone loss so that you don't lose more than that approximately 1% per year. Uh, bisphosphonates can be used. Bisphosphonates basically go into the blood and they attach to the bone and then the osteoclasts eat the bisphosphonates and that induces apoptosis in the osteoclasts. Now of course if you remove the osteoclasts from the picture then you won't be removing bone as much and so therefore you'll, you'll, you'll decrease the rate of loss of bone. Um, estrogen replacement therapy is debated. However, theoretically, it would be helpful, and that's because estrogen protects against the loss of bone. And glucocorticoids are contraindicated, and that's because they increase the risk of osteoporosis. Paget's disease of bone is an imbalance between osteoclast and osteoblast function. Now let's remind ourselves that the osteoblasts lay down bone and the osteoclasts they resorb bone. And these two cells are in balance. In fact, the osteoblast is the one that manages the osteoclast. For example, when PTH is released by the parathyroid, it's very high yield to note that the PTH actually hits the osteoblast. That's the cell that has the PTH receptor. And the osteoblast then tells the osteoclast that it can resorb bone. So the osteoclast does not work without the permission of the osteoblast. Now what happens in Paget's disease of bone is that the osteoclast goes crazy and begins to resorb bone without the permission of the osteoblast. So he's resorbing bone, resorbing bone, resorbing bone, and the osteoblast is sort of just sitting there and watching. Now once there's so much resorption of bone that the bone becomes weak, the osteoblast then recognizes that it needs to lay down as much bone as possible to protect the bone. So the osteoblast then joins in and starts trying to put down as much bone as possible, but it's doing it in a rush. Finally, the osteoclast sort of burns out, and then you're left with the osteoblast, and the osteoblast is just trying to lay down as much bone as possible, but, it doesn't, but it's doing it in a rush and doesn't do a good job. And this is going to become more clear in a minute. Now, this disorder is usually seen in late adulthood, approximately the age of 60. And we don't know the etiology, but it's possibly viral. So the idea here is that a virus would infect the osteoclast, making it crazy. Important to note that this is a localized process that involves one or more bones. It does not, it does not involve the entire skeleton. Now again, I've already told you about the stages. In the first stage, the osteoclast goes crazy. Eventually, the osteoblast needs to then lay down bone, and so you get a mixed osteoblastic-osteoclastic phase until finally the osteoclast sort of burns out, and the osteoblast then begins to lay down as much bone as possible. Now the end result of all of this is that you get thick sclerotic bone because the osteoblast is laying down as much bone as possible, but it's not laid down with the balance of the osteoclast. Remember that bone requires a proper balance, and so it fractures easily. Here's an image of what happens in Paget's disease of bone, and the idea here is that you get bone, however, you have all of these cement lines in between the bone which have not been sealed. And so although you have thick bone, the bone is very fragile because these lines have not yet been sealed. And so this is also called the mosaic pattern of lamellar bone. Mosaic pattern because it appears that you have all these puzzle pieces. In fact, I call this puzzle piece bone. And it's lamellar because you have all these lines of bone laid down appropriately. Remember, bone is normally laid down in layers. However, again, there's this mosaic puzzle piece pattern because you haven't been able to properly connect the pieces of bone. The clinical features are bone pain, and that's because you get microfractures of the bone. One of the common clinical descriptions is that the patient comes in and says they have an increasing hat size, and that's because the skull is commonly affected. 
and of course this disease results in thick sclerotic bone. There can be hearing loss if you get thickening of the bone which then impringes on the cranial nerves. There can be a lion-like facies and that's when the facial bones become thick and sclerotic giving the face a lion-like appearance. And very high yield, the patients often have an isolated elevated alkaline phosphatase. Now recall that at the end stage of this disorder, the osteoblasts are going to be laying down bone. And of course, the osteoclasts have alkaline phosphatase to create an alkaline environment so that you can mineralize the bone. And so you're going to have a high alkaline phosphatase, and that's very high yield. The calcium will be normal, the phosphate will be normal, the PTH will be normal. However, the alkaline phosphatase will be elevated. The treatments include calcitonin. Recall that calcitonin is sort of like the anti-PTH. It does the opposite of what PTH would normally do. And so if PTH normally causes the osteoclast to resorb bone, then calcitonin actually inhibits the osteoclast from resorbing bone. And so if you inhibit the osteoclast, remember that the first phase of the disease was the osteoclastic phase. You can, you can then avoid the resorption of bone that occurs in this disorder. And bisphosphonates would result in apoptosis of the osteoclast, of course, also then inhibiting the osteoclast in this disorder. The complications are particularly high yield and include high output cardiac failure. Now the idea here is when you have all of this remodeling of bone, you're going to get formation of AV shunts, and the heart will then have to push through those AV shunts, which would then result in high output cardiac failure. An additional complication is osteosarcoma. Patients with Paget's disease of bone are at increased risk for osteosarcoma. And the way I remember this is that the osteoblasts at the end of the disease are going to be producing a ton of bone. And if the osteoblasts get mutated in the process of this disorder, they can then develop an osteosarcoma. And an osteosarcoma is a malignant tumor of osteoblasts. Osteomyelitis is infection of the marrow space in the bone, and it usually occurs in children. It's most often bacterial, and the bacteria get into the bone via hematogenous spread. Now in children you get a transient bacteremia which then results in seeding of the metaphysis whereas in adults you classically have an open wound which results in bacteremia which then seeds the epiphysis. Recall that if this is bone and this is the growth plate here you've got the epiphysis here, the metaphysis here, and the diaphysis here. And so again in children it's usually the metaphysis that gets seeded with bacteria whereas in adults it's usually the epiphysis and that's actually high yield. The causes of osteomyelitis include Staph aureus. This is the overall most common cause. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea can do it, especially in sexually active young adults. Salmonella is the most common cause in sickle cell disease. Pseudomonas is an important cause in a diabetic or an IV drug abuser. Uh, pasturella is an important cause in a patient that has been exposed to a dog or cat bite or a dog or cat scratch. Uh, and TB can also cause osteomyelitis. And remember that when TB involves the bone, it classically involves the lumbar vertebra, and we call that POTS disease. The clinical features of osteomyelitis is that you'll have bone pain with fever and leukocytosis. Of course, the patient is infected with a bacteria. The infection results in a lytic focus, which represents liquefactive necrosis, which is surrounded by sclerosis on x-ray. So the idea here is that if this is the bone, and of course in a child it would be in the metaphysis, you'll get an area of necrosis here, and then that will be surrounded by reactive bone, which will then create sclerosis around that area of necrosis. And so that's an important finding on x-ray. Then the diagnosis can be made by blood culture. The last disorder in this section is avascular aseptic necrosis. Now again, here you get a focus of necrosis in the bone, but it's aseptic. It's not due to bacteria, as was the case in osteomyelitis. In instead, it's due to the fact that you have a lack of blood flow to the bone, which then results in necrosis of the bone. So this is ischemic necrosis of the bone and the bone marrow. Causes include trauma or fracture, which can disrupt the blood supply to the bone, resulting in necrosis. Uh, steroids increase the risk for avascular necrosis. Sickle cell disease, the classic example being dactylitis, where you get vasoocclusive crisis within the bones of the hands and the feet, resulting in uh, avascular aseptic necrosis of the bone. N.K. Sanz disease, which is the circumstance in which you develop gas emboli, in particular nitrogen, which then precipitates out of the blood and then can lodge within the bone, giving you a avascular necrosis. Important to note that the complications of avascular necrosis include osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a wear and tear disease in which you damage the joint of the bone. If you have necrosis of the bone underneath the joint, that would increase the risk for damage to the joint, giving you osteoarthritis. And of course, if the bone is necrotic, it can also easily fracture. And so that would be a complication of avascular aseptic necrosis.
And that concludes this particular section.